Bach Conversations, I have the privilege of welcoming Professor Yo Tomita. We're looking forward to talking. Here we are at Cambridge, it's a beautiful town. We've just had Bach Network dialogue meetings, and we're just at the very end. And I'll just put a grab uh, Yo, uh, very stimulating person to talk to. I've learned myself an enormous amount from him and anticipate doing so, continuing to the future if we have the uh, ability to keep communicating as we do. I've, I've learned myself an enormous amount and I love to apply musicology. I have a very positive view of it. So welcome, it's, it's wonderful to talk to you. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I'd love to just uh, ask you a few questions yeah. about yourself. Mm -hmm. What do you personally find stimulating uh, about being a musicologist? Well, musicologist, but I think we do. Uh, as a musicologist, we usually communicate to performers through editions, or the new edition may be created from the discovery of a new source. Um, but recently I found an interesting new area of source research, which I'm very glad that Daniel, you came on, on mm. board and communicate together to learn from this undocumented areas of Bach's thought process, I think it manifests in the form of his beautiful calligraphy. Yes, it's mm. a wonderful area. And uh, I'd love to get on to talking about that shortly. Mm. Uh, do you find musicology to be a challenging area personally? Do you find you, you struggle in some ways? Of course, there's an element of excitement and, and discovery that has to be, but at um, the same time, Obviously, there, mm. there will be some personal challenges. Yeah, of course. Uh, but uh, from my perspective, or, uh, initially I started my music, musical career as a performer. At the time, I had to get up and play in front of people and got stomachache after getting nervous. <laughs> but as a musicologist, we could be seen in a dark corner of the <laughs> library where nobody cares. Uh, but looking at the primary source, very precious and expensive material and it could be an exciting, it's a direct contact, just only surviving fragments of oh, history yeah. that uh, as a performer you may not have a chance to have a look at it, but it's a privilege to be able to see these things and being inspired by looking at the original handwriting, but as a musicologist we don't see people, our excitement about our lives. So, um, something that I learned from this dark place of study to be picked up by a performer like yourself, Daniel, and to make an illuminating performance out of the idea that uh, we discover in dark corner of library to the bright <laughs> uh, uh, spotlight on, on the platform is some, something that we really have uh, um, complete life as a musicologist, I think. We, without the presence of performer, work of musicologists have no place. So collaboration make ourselves complete, I think. It's a complete contribution to the musical world. That's very interesting. Mm. Uh, in some ways you're a historian, I suppose. You would, would you regard yourself as well? Uh, mm. Gathering rare and precious information and this, there's a process of discovery, isn't there? Mm. Uh, when you'd be looking through and suddenly a new concept would strike you, something that you actually hadn't considered before, and then it, it would really grab your attention and make you feel like you were compelled to look into it more. Mm. And that, that moment must be exciting because there are so many new discoveries taking place still. Mm. A new uh, manuscripts is turning up from time to time during the process of digitization and cataloging. Um, librarians are finding something that they didn't know before, and by um, creating a new catalog, they need to know um, who composed this piece that nobody knew before and get into all sorts of other um, catalogs. Uh, from different institutions and by piecing together all this information one gradually unpacks the information that they are looking for. It's a long process 
but because of this um, almost like a competitive uh, process now, um, every library is going to sort out what they possess and partially it's a process of preservation that they make a digital copy and another uh, case it, it is a competition for um, how they obtain fundings from government sources or other institutional sources to uh, make um, for their own survival. So it is a very good environment that we live so that musicologists have need much more information than uh, our previous generation. Mm, more opportunity to discover new knowledge. Yeah, and Bark Digital. Yeah. Bark Digital is uh, a wonderful resource. There's more to come, mm -hmm. but uh, it's very useful, isn't it? Seriously, I've benefited myself. And as a performer, uh, I've found a lot of inspiration uh, from these things. To me, it gives me uh, a lot more options. There are already a multiplicity of options in interpretation from many different sources and areas, but now we have, um, particularly, we've been talking about this newer discovery of Bach's quaver beamings and what they might suggest. Mm. And because it's a relatively new area, there are a thousand questions. Um, but every question is extremely interesting and has potential. Mm. So would you like to tell us a little bit about the subject? Mm. Yeah. Now, during Bach's time, um, when Bach writes beamed quavers, he could write in different lengths, depending on the situation. For instance, if it is a uh, 3-4 time, there are three quavers. In terms of quavers, there are six spaces. You could group them in different lengths. Normally, 3-4 time, we see Bach beaming throughout in one unit. So six quavers being beamed as a single unit. Mm. But on other occasions, he splits into three units. One, two, one, two, one, two. And when we look at uh, wide-ranging surviving sources, gradually some interesting picture emerges. Sometimes it, it could be explained logically why Bach chose longer one and or short one mixed together, sometimes exclusively done in one way. But most of the time, Bach used both types in specific way. And that is an interesting opportunity to think why he's done that. Mm. And what is quite remarkable um, to me is that it's a new area of discussion. And the reason being that the publishers have decided to standardize the beaming. For mm. example, as we, we've just been discussing this actually in the Bach Network dialogue meetings uh, of the last days intensively mm. going around in our minds uh, every waking moment practically, I think. So the question is why mm. um, the publishers, why would the publishers ignore these and standardize them? In other words, if Bach wrote uh, pairs of quavers with short beams, Publishers would think that was a little inconvenient and turn it looks them into uglier than uh, <laughs> yes. It's a bit of an encumbrance for mm. the, the poor editor. Why don't they pay more respect to such things? We don't, we don't know. Uh, because we couldn't explain it. No. We couldn't convince the publisher that this is an important aspect to no. keep. So mm. it's, it is, it's very interesting because superficially, mm. I suppose with limited knowledge, you would think that you have the same notes, same note value, the same notes, you're, you're going to play them in the same way. What, what difference can the length of a beam have, ultimately, in your interpretation? Aren't you simply going to look at four quavers and play them as four quavers? Um, so, your response to that? Mm. Well, that is ultimately a performance decision. These causes can only suggest in what context those beamings are specifically chosen to me. So what we could do is to explain the background of Bach's thought process, what might, he might have felt about mm. his notes. Mm. Mm. For, for example, a good example is the G minor fugue from Wurtemberg Clavier II. first 
instance of the, what I noticed on, while editing that uh, edition for Henley. Um, 2005 or 6, the edition itself appeared in 2007. And I think we've already been through four stages of maximum six exchanges of Stich uh, Polake, uh, we call this uh, engraver's uh, model. I thought that distinction that Bach made between the fugue subject for which he chose longer beaming in three-four time, and then episodes where most of the time Bach used you two chose short ones. Mm. So one, two, one, two, one, two appears in episodes, whilst one, two, three, four, five, six appears in a few subjects. Yes, the G minor fugue, it's very powerful uh, with those repeated notes at the beginning, very insistent driving. And the hypothesis is that they're to be seen in one the extended beam of six repeated notes. And then what happens after that in the rest of the fugue? Mm. Yeah, the sub fugue subjects are maintained basically in that form, using the long beam, but shorter beams cut into three segments appear most uh, of the episodes where harmonic shifts is apparent. So as a performer, you know, when, when you perform it, um, few subjects are treated melodically. Perhaps you may be feeling the, the uh, forward drive, mm. whereas I'm sure that uh, you react differently by seeing in short beams mm. at episodes. Yes, you, you do. You see these pairs and you think, well, I have to somehow keep this intensity and yet there's a, a variety of articulation that's possible. Mm. All sorts of options come to mind, but uh, definitely just thinking in, in one, two, uh, it really intensifies those episodes. And then when the subject returns in its full power. Mm. Yeah, the important thing here, Daniel, is that in this piece, Bach demonstrates the possibility of distinguishing the devices melodic devices in fugue subject and harmonic shift in episodes by notational means. He clearly gives us indication and hints uh, how he processed these two different areas of music. Mm. So that is only we can, we as a musicologist give you um, as a, you know, a general advice that Bach may have been aware of this analytical angle of composition. For this instance, mm. there are many other cases that you will learn from Beaming, but for this week, we can learn that Bach was highlighting these by notational means. Mm. And it's up to you to make this um, a logically and a powerfully dramatic effect. That's right. Or not. Yeah. yeah, so you, you automatically would articulate that, I think, anyway, with the increasing harmonic rhythm. Mm. But seeing these, does definitely certainly alter the way you do that, mm. and each individual will respond differently. That's a fascinating case. There are so many mm. throughout the entire 48, thanks to you. Oh no. With your. <laughs> but it is your suggestion that you notice that at the end of this fugue, um, whilst Bach normally uses shorter beam to articulate the cadence, in this fugue, Bach used a longer beam, followed by rests. Um, and then that it was you who suggested that Bach re interacted with uh, the music in a specific way. That's a fascinating case. Mm -hmm. Also at the end of the B major, prelude right. in the pre prelude of book two, mm -hmm. same thing. And you have a very abrupt ending, um, short last mm -hmm. chord followed by rest. And, uh, but it's, it's very, very interesting. We're, we're hypothesizing that it could mean that there was no deliberation near the end, in other words, a very minimal sense of slowing. Mm. Uh, whereas, in fact, you've, you have pairs of quavers often before a cadence, don't you? Which yeah. signifies that you should perhaps take naturally more time. Mm -hmm. And you pointed out to me that the Goldberg Variations aria in the penultimate bar of each half, you have pairs of quavers, whereas prior to that, you've had the extended beams, which is 
connecting the whole bar. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's very, very interesting indeed. Another uh, fascinating case is the D minor fugue from book two. Yeah, that piece is left to us in uh, without Bach's autograph, but fortunately we have in his wife's handwriting. Um, she is an exceptional copyist. She copies a beautiful calligraphy, but also she preserves the characteristics of her husband's handwriting. So the being an anomaly in this piece could be seen as an evidence of what Bach actually left to us. Now, in the first half of that piece, in Hugh's exposition, quavers are grouped in a longer form. Um, beams are connected, four beams are four, quavers are connected in chromatic descending scale. Whereas in the second half of the fugue, uh, we find in group of two. And that was a mystery to me. Yeah. And when we looked at the uh, fugue as a piece, the complete piece, um, there's something significant takes place at that particular point. That is, that inversion is introduced together with stretcher. And with the increased intensity of the piece, may have been a deciding factor for Bach to switch from the normal longer beaming to exceptional shorter beaming. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my hypothetical explanation of this is Bach reached the threshold of his maximum capacity to follow individual melodic development, but just have to be segmented beat by beat. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of very few explanations that I could find. Personally, when I look at that, and I, what I was trying to, to do in my demonstrations yesterday was to feel the, the extraordinary, painful nature of the dissonances. When, when you would naturally feel in groups of two, you would very slightly linger on the first of, of, of the pair. Hmm. And it, it really it does intensify that painful Passus durius schoolus, that mm. chromatic light. And there's a, just a very natural sense that one would do that when looking at it. And of course it's extremely subjective. Um, but I think all of these things are, are justifiable and uh, exciting to contemplate. Mm. The important thing is that you get conviction out of that. Mm. And that's reflecting in you know, convincing performance. And I'm extremely pleased that if you take what I suggest as a source of your inspiration and conviction in performance. Yes, yeah, you, you do have to be yourself. Um, with every aspect of performance mm. you have to have thought through, mm. has to be uh, very often an instinctive component, um, and it has to be overridden by your complete emotional uh, absorption into the music. But these factors, the, these areas of study, have their place, uh, and personally, I, I find them extremely inspiring mm. and influential, and I'm thankful to you. Now, finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about the second part, Tita. That's a very interesting case in the first movement of that, where you have three different parts, three parts of that movement. Uh, would you like to share? Mm. Your thoughts about that? Yeah, now the first part is uh, broadly in the style of French overture, uh, dotted rhythm is throughout, followed by um, the section called Andante, and that section is written by using short beams throughout. And this example is another uh, of my theory is that when Bach applies short beam consistently, means that he's outside of Bach's tempo ordinario. And then followed by the fugue. That is the main point. Fugue subject, first fugue subject is written by using 
longer beam, followed by a short beam. So subject and answer is slightly uh, contradictory. I explained this as one of three modes of box use of uh, quaver beaming, that is uh, character beaming, musical beaming, and then this one is unintelligible beaming. Mm. I couldn't figure out the meaning behind it. But Daniel, it was you who suggested a term, variety. Bach not only logically demonstrating from time to time, but there were occasions where Bach pursues for variety. And on this occasion, few subject which recurs in the same shape basically, but characterized differently by beaming. Yes, it's a wonderfully powerful movement mm. and I'm, I'm just so excited about this discovery which you pointed out to me not too long ago. It suddenly, it's like an explosion of different thoughts and ideas have come to mind and I've been through uh, all 48 and I, I mean, I'm trying to make sense. Personally, it's going to take a long time and I will continue to evolve in my thoughts but I'm looking forward to discussing this more with you and having more dialogue. What's been so wonderful about this dialogue meeting here, Bark Network, is, is the freedom that we have to talk and discuss and all sorts of new thoughts and ideas come to mind. So I'm very grateful uh, to have spoken with you. I look forward to next time. I hope that, that the viewers can appreciate something of the excitement and the interest of musicology uh, and it's a pleasure to know you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Daniel. For today, uh, Professor Yotamita. Thank you.